Well, uh, thank you for having us here. So I'm a fourth year medical student and currently on my rural rotation. Um, I chose uh, Pocahontas County uh, and it's uh, very beautiful out here. I knew that when I came out here, I wanted to do um, a psychiatry case in, in rural medicine and understand the resources available for psychiatry in a more remote, remote area, but also understand sort of, you know, um, what, what needs primary care physicians require in those areas. So this is a case that Dr. Hare and I uh, looked at together and agreed on. Um, a case that kind of shows uh, both um, some of very good points, uh, like in a rural area that are good teaching points, but also areas where she felt that she could have used more guidance. So I thought it might be good for Echo. So um, the patient, um, this is a new patient, age 68, uh, female gender, um, with Medicare insurance. She had a past medical history of bipolar one disorder, as well as several comorbidities. Um, she had a bilateral tubal ligation 40, uh, um, 40 years ago, and a lifelong history of chronic diarrhea. She first presented on October 28th for follow-up management of gout and blood pressure. She said that she had been confused recently and was experiencing intense diarrhea three, three days prior. She admitted to some forgetfulness and had a visit with her psychiatrist a week ago where her zeprazidone was increased from 40 milligrams daily to twice daily. She endorsed the medical non-adherence, um, which was secondary to her husband being unable to provide medication early in the morning. Um, she had a family history of alcoholism, um, heart disease in the father, um, and hypertension in, in uh, her mother. There was no definitive psychiatric family history, but her daughter said um, that her mother was uh, having these, these symptoms as well. Um, she grew up in a household where uh, medical illness was, or uh, mental illness was not very well addressed, um, and she was repeatedly told that she was depressed. Um, husband felt that he, that the family couldn't handle this together, so he took on a lot of that guilt himself. Um, her daughter reported that a lot of her behavior that she had um, seemed to amplify after high school. Um, she doesn't drink any alcohol, and she's a former three-pack-per-day smoker who quit three years ago. She has several chronic medical conditions, as you can see here. Um, on physical exam, she has muscle and joint aches. However, the remainder of the neurological exam was unremarkable. So behavioral assessment on intake. So she seemed to have um, recent memory loss and confusion um, and a lot of difficulty sleeping. She had no delusions, hallucinations, or abnormal thoughts, and no homicide or suicidal ideations. She did fail the uh, three-word three -word recall and clock draw. And I really want to direct you to, um, we'll address her labs uh, in a little while, but um, her psychotropic medication, she takes sertraline, um, hydrochloride, 50 milligrams once a day at bedtime. She takes trihexylphenidyl for uh, extra paranormal symptoms. Um, Diva Prolex, she takes uh, trazodone and ziprazidone, which was recently increased, um, as well as a number of uh, medications for chronic medical conditions, as you can see here. So we can actually scroll down a little bit more. We're gonna come back to the um, medication changes in a bit. So at the conclusion of our visit, we had her follow up for uric acid, um, gave her allopurinol, um, fiber supplementation to uh, address the diarrhea, but we didn't really change any medications. As you can see here, um, the patient returned early with deteriorating mental status. She had bruising on her left jaw, and her husband said that um, that bruising wasn't left when he left for work, so they came in. Uh, mental, uh, mini mental status exam was 18. Um, she had difficulty sleeping, um, had, uh, was having visual and auditory hallucinations, of people in her home. And it, it was found that she had ran out of trazodone. So we went ahead and we re refilled the trazodone and we had to return two weeks to sort of assess like the, the mental status and see if that would improve anything. She ended up coming back uh, near the end of November saying that um, one of the uh, medications was making her dizzy and she was having some weight loss since her last visit. Appetite had decreased and sleep and memory um, had seemed to improve. She did uh, actually a lot better on the word recall, um, the test that she failed at the last visit. And here we can see the labs 
Um, her urate was up at 7.9. Uh, vitamin D um, uh, and several other labs were within normal limits. Um, she did have an increased creatinine and glucose, um, and she is a, she is a diabetic, so that was to be expected. That's part of the reason why her uh, for her uh, mood stabilization, um, Diva Prolix was chosen. So at this point, we felt that with her symptoms not being well managed, we wanted her to have a, a different look. Um, so we referred her to um, a different psychiatric facility to look at the medication. Uh, at this time, we were thinking her diagnosis was consistent with bipolar 1, uh, possibly schizoaffective disorder and dementia. We had her um, follow up in two weeks and did not make um, two to four weeks with uh, no medication changes at the time. So around the beginning of December, she experienced significant deterioration. Uh, she flooded the bathroom with her clothes, um, overflowed the coffee pot, uh, was eating raw hamburger, admitted to auditory and visual hallucinations and speaking to people who had died. Um, so per her primary psychiatric service, um, she was sent to a geriatric uh, inpatient facility. Um, with this acute worsening, we were concerned of uh, either a bipolar manic episode or some drug-induced delirium. So we scheduled a follow-up after her inpatient visit. So when we saw her again at uh, the beginning of January, she was doing a, she was doing a lot um, subjectively better. Uh, uh, husband didn't bring the medication list, but uh, she did have a significant decrease in medication burden and, and started a denazepil. She was more functional at home without any of this uh, uh, aberrant behavior. Um, she denied any visual auditory hallucinations or difficulty sleeping. So we scheduled for a three-month follow-up for uh, also for her chronic care. Um, we found that uh, when she came up to follow up in uh, April, she was doing well with her uh, diabetes medication and um, wasn't having any hallucinations, abnormal behavior, sleep changes. She continues to follow her local um, psychiatrist. Uh, we reviewed the medication list, and this is actually where we can scroll up. And um, if we can look at, I, I like them kind of side by side because you can really see the uh, medication, the change in medication burden. So it's going to be a little bit higher, just where we have medications listed. Right there, yes. So we can see that um, the sertraline, trihexylphenidol, and Divaprolix, if you uh, scroll down just a little bit, uh, a little bit more, um, you can see the psychotropic medications. She's on Dazepil with a Zeprazidone, and that's 20 in the morning and 80 at night. Um, Trazidone, PRN, and melatonin. So they were actually able to uh, to take out her uh, mood stabilizing agent, the Divaprolix and the sertraline and the trihexyphenidol, and she was doing a lot better. Um, so if we can go ahead and uh, scroll down uh, a little bit more. Yeah, kind of kind of back down to April. Uh, that's great. Um, so we followed up again uh, in three months, and she was uh, able to attend the, appoint the appointment by herself. Um, the family said that she still had some mild confusion, but there weren't, wasn't any recurrence of these uh, psychiatric symptoms that she had before. So in conclusion, we think this case was, does a pretty good job of showing some continuity of care, um, and also importantly addressing uh, polypharmacy and uh, a somewhat complex patient. Um, she seemed to be managed pretty well uh, addressing the acute delirium, um, which uh, could be uh, due to the trihexylphenidyl and sort of the anticholinergic effects. Um, and she also did pretty well with uh, discontinuing the Divaprolex. Um, so sort of treating this as, um, it's sort of muddy as what, if it's like a bipolar sort of presentation. But we were thinking maybe a schizoaffective with like a bipolar subtype because um, the, the antipsychotic uh, uh, regimen that we had uh, seems to be doing pretty well for her. Um, sort of other uh, important uh, remarks, um, trihexophenidyl, it is a, a Beers criteria medication. Um, so in like the geriatric population, uh, that um, sort of should be addressed. And um, I actually, I, uh, I recently saw a, a JAMA article um, uh, yesterday and uh, is there any way that I could screen share briefly? 
Absolutely. Let me uh, make you co-host and then you should be able to do it. Let's see. All right. Let me know if you're able to do it. Awesome. Let's see here. Okay. I mean, I mean, literally like yesterday, August 18th, um, I saw this, the pre prevalence of psychotropic and opioid prescription among community dwelling older adults with dementia. Um, so this report was looking at um, um, Medicaid part, uh, Medicare Part D um, fee-for-service uh, patients. And um, what they found is that, if we go to the uh, discussion here, it's that there, there seems to be a, a higher burden on a lot of psychotropic medications on patients who are older um, with uh, fee-for-service plans. Um, and as you can see, they kind of listed the top, the top 20 here. And there's actually a couple that um, our patient was on. There was a Diva Prolex, uh, Sertraline. So um, these medications, you know, they, they do have their risks, but when you start stacking them, you know, it, it does increase a burden. Uh, so there definitely could be an element of reimbursement that plays into sort of the polypharmacy that we're seeing. So I thought that was sort of interesting to share. Um, okay. So um, we have a couple. We have a couple questions, sort of, um, just to kind of get the ball rolling. Uh, things that we thought were interesting. Just checking my time. Um, uh, Ms. Fur, you can go back and share the document if you if you like. So um, I just want to really open this up to uh, questions that you have for us. Um, these were sort of uh, questions that I thought uh, may be sort of interesting, like for the ECHO team. Um, but certainly, uh, I'd, I'd like to just kind of open it up. If you, if you have an answer to one of these questions that you'd like to share with us, um, or if you have other questions you'd like to ask us, then um, we'd really like to hear it. Thank you so much, Richard. That was really awesome and super extensive and uh, excellent presentation. So um, yeah, I'll open it up to any questions, um, perhaps any of the recommendations or responses to the questions here uh, that Richard listed for us. I'll keep the screen share up so you guys can all take a look at it as well, but I'll just open it up uh, to everyone out there. Great presentation, Richard. It's great to see you on here. Um, I'll just add a, a couple of thoughts. Certainly, geriatric medicine, I would I would say, I is is probably the last thing I I'm an expert at in this point with with focusing more on kids. But a lot of times, some of the similar principles of, about just being more mindful and, and cautious um, on the the opposite ends of of life still play at hand, and and certainly can lend some thoughts to that. Um, I, I suspect the first question, I, I at least in West Virginia, the, the answer is going to be how, how readily able can we get into providers that specialize in geriatric medicine, geriatric psychiatrists and geriatric trained medical um, uh, IM doctors are, are really rare. And, I, and, and so finding ways to um, kind of connect with them sometimes or, or do consultation with them even through something like the Mars line might might be a helpful way to just talk about general principles too because those may be may be challenging. Um, injectables are certainly um, an option. Um, you can do that. There's a lot of like insurance limitations on that. Some insurances do not cover long-acting injectables and there's lots of rules about that and some of those medicines um, like the geodon is not doesn't have a long acting uh, easy, uh, it's not It's not one that comes in a lot. There's short acting IM geodon, but there's not a long acting that I'm aware of for geodon. So there, there have to be some some considerations of, of cross titration. Um, the other interesting thing, and I'm sorry, I, I missed it if you said this, but um, I, it's something always to remember that Geodon has a very interesting sort of profile where it's really dependent on eating food and stomach acidity. So when the, the, the diarrhea was occurring and some of the GI things, also wonder if there was an absorption 
issue that might be contributing that have contributed to that. Um, and I, I would say for number three, I think I always value primary care physicians input about polypharmacy, especially sometimes as they see side effects um, from things I might prescribe that I might miss or between patients that I would always value that collaboration. And I know that geriatric psychiatrists share that very much. Um, I think it's really challenging in patients that have long-standing psychiatric illness because if you if you've had bipolar disorder for most of your life and it's been severe, you, you probably do need to maintain on some degree of maintenance recommendations for a very long time because you're at very high risk for a relapse and it can look very confusing on top of other medical problems. And so um the answer may be if they've had three clear episodes or been severe enough to be hospitalized or suicidal, they may never be able to discontinue uh, psychotropic medications. And you do have to continue to manage the side effects, change doses um, often throughout life just in response to that while still maintaining efficacy. Um, and I think it becomes a very individualized decision. And then you start having things like dementia concerns and memory concerns on top of it. You really have to pare down things that have anticholinergic effects and, and all the sedating effects because you or fall risks because it just compounds the fact. And so um, I think it's, I think the question, I think the answer is, I, I think you have to think about polypharmacy and lowest possible but efficacious dose at, at every visit um, with, with those patients. And, and often I can't do that alone as a psychiatrist and, and I'm sure a geriatric psychiatrist always appreciates that collaboration, I think that's how we give patients the best the best care. So. Thank you, Dr. Slager. Any other thoughts, comments, questions for Richard? So I had a couple of thoughts for you. I want to get um, so as a psychologist, medicine's not my area, uh, but the first thing that came to my mind with the sertraline and the possible manic episode was whether that was new and was the Zoloft what was kind of um, initiating some of that mania. Um, and the other thought I had for you was with the schizoaffective disorder. Um, I'm not sure if there's more to our history that we didn't really get into, but um, being careful to really consider whether it's just bipolar with psychotic symptoms uh, versus that um, schizoaffective. So really is are the psychotic symptoms there without the mood symptoms or do the moods or do the psychotic symptoms remit when the mania goes away um, as well to keep in mind but nice presentation uh, thank you for that um that's actually a really great point about uh the sertraline inducing um an episode of uh, uh bipolar disorder and those um maybe it's they think they're treating depression and ends up inducing um in terms of uh, how long the search volume is going on, um, that detail is a little less clear uh, based on our history, but that could have been a really great idea to um, to kind of figure that out a little more. Um, and kind of going with the uh, schizoaffective versus bipolar, uh, I, I uh, maybe another um, psychiatrist can sort of like uh, uh, key into what their perspective is, but I imagine it's, it's pretty difficult to find that window, um, especially with other medications where you can definitively say, um, because uh, while the patient was in our care, um, there was always uh, some uh, medications on board, which maybe might make it a little more difficult, but I'd love to hear more thoughts. Well, I, from the medicine standpoint with that, I, I think I think it's a it's a good point. If you if you really don't think that it's more of a primary like thought disorder like schizoaffective, you you may be able to simplify things and just treat with mood stabilizers as opposed to the combination. Um, so so she was on. I'm sorry, I don't have the med list. But she was on two. She was on a, a traditional mood stabilizer and and the Geodon. Is that correct? She was, yes. Yeah. Um, yeah, so like, like as I said, there's just a lot, there's a lot of questions. I think the sertraline was a good question. Um, so, you know, she's on a thousand milligrams of Depakote, which, which is maybe a very solid dose, depending on what the level is for mania. If, if oftentimes, if it's truly bipolar with psychotic features, you might be able to stop the antipsychotic and just remain on the mood stabilizer. Now, remember, all antipsychotics are mood stabilizers. So the question then becomes, like, 
both of these medicines in their own right may maintain maintenance for bipolar disorder. This one's the only one that's kind of, the, the G dog's the only one that's kind of treat psychosis if it's more of a primary thought disorder. So you essentially may have two agents kind of overlapping, but she might need those if she had re remission. Some of these other things like the sertraline and the trazodone are probably kind of more accessory at, at, at times because they're in pretty low doses and trazodone is probably just be being used for um, I'm asleep, I'm, I'm guessing, but um, trazodone too has a pretty high risk of orthostatic hypertension and can cause some confusion and, and things in its own right that you want to be a little more cautious as, as people get older too. So I think sometimes figuring out how to narrow down those for what you know about the patient. Again, when she's not able to provide a lot of her own history, this becomes um, almost impossible <laughs> to tease out because it's such a, a lifelong kind of answer and her family may not know either. Um, so it can become, become really tricky. And, and sometimes you peel off the things you don't don't see active at the moment too. Um, but but certainly looking at that that list, you kind of, it's, it's a good point that you, you don't know entirely what's tar targeting what. And I find it really helpful to remind myself <laughs> Um, and then to, in my documentation that as I start something, I always list exactly what it was for. Like, was I targeting clear psychosis? Was I targeting clear mania? So especially with some of these dual agents so that when you get to different phases of the illness, it makes it a little easier to go back and, and remember for that patient. Um, as opposed to just saying they're both for bipolar disorder can be really helpful if you can specify that. But I said, it, it, you're right, it's really messy and it's really hard to, <laughs> to go back and, and, and figure it out, especially if you didn't do it, <laughs> um, too. Awesome. Any other final thoughts, questions, comments? If anyone thinks of anything after the fact, uh, please feel free to use the chat feature and we can always address it afterwards as well. Um, but okay, all right. Thank you so much, Richard. That was excellent. There was a lot of great discussion too. And were there any other questions you had for the group before we move towards the didactic portion? I, I think we're pretty uh, good, Dr. Heron. So uh, thank you for uh, having us speak. Excellent, awesome, thank you. Um, all right, so we will go to the didactic portion. Let me pull it up and or actually, let me give you co-host, uh, Dr. Swagger, and I'll let you pull it up yourself. It might be easier that way. All right. So this is part two of, of, I guess, the one I did in July. We were talking about pediatric anxiety disorders, and I, I think um, we can share that whole um, PowerPoint with you if you missed the beginning. It's talking a little bit more about diagnosing and the different types of anxiety disorder in kids. And today we're kind of moving to treatment and um, Amanda Newhouse is going to help me and chime in a little bit on some of the therapy options. We're going to talk about some, some tricks that we use to kind of translate therapy, CBT especially, down to kid level um, with, with therapeutic treatments. And then also kind of just briefly given some, some basics about um, when and if and how to do the, the prescribing piece. So I'm going to screen share. and. Um, again, just please feel free to just interrupt me right in the middle if, if you have a question. Okay. Does that look good to everybody? Okay. So uh, we talked a little bit about sort of when you might need to consider treatment. Certainly, a lot of times we, we really want to identify high risk uh, students that might be at risk for anxiety disorders. That may be students that um, have high family histories or burdens of, of anxiety, kids that may be exposed to adverse um, life events that may be at higher risk. Um, certainly, anything in, in sort of the community that may cause a lot of change or chaos can be pretty challenging. And, and the goal is also to really improve functionality. And, and probably anyone that's ever heard me talk, the, the functioning of the child is really, really key, especially around school. Sometimes the time they get to, to treatment is because they've been refusing to do things and refusing to go to school. 
um, which can be really, really challenging. So thinking about how this child is functioning and how far it's off normal may kind of dictate, is this an early process or a late process? So from, from a therapeutic standpoint, we, we kind of think about, we don't think about kids as little adults. We, we think about where their brain is and how it works and what cognitive level it is. And there's a sort of a, a cognitive split that occurs. If you're thinking about children under seven, you may be considering, you know, their, how they think. They tend to be much more magical. They have trouble with logic. They have trouble with perspective taking and time. But a lot of the interventions sometimes for kids under seven are going to be really focused on helping their parents help them find words to describe what they're going through. Um, we're teaching the, the parent to be the therapeutic deliverer of skills so that those things can be maintained at home or practice. As a kid gets a little bit older and they develop logical thinking and that basic concrete thinking between seven and 11, you can start introducing some cognitive behavioral techniques that, that may be very helpful to them, but at their level, at the way that they can understand it. And one of the, the, the fan favorites, I guess, for anxiety per se is called Coping Cat. I don't know if any of you have, have heard this, but this is the manualized workbook for um, kids for from from seven to, to 12 is probably its target group that's really targeting skills developing specific phobia social phobia panic um and whatnot and i'll show you some some things from that but it, it does a lot of education about what anxiety was it talks about how in in kids we talked about how a lot of those anxiety symptoms may be coming out as as gi illness or muscle tension or sleep so it does a lot of like understanding how your body feels when it gets stressed and behavioral techniques you can practice, like how you can breathe and, 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 and how that deep breathing kind of hacks your parasympathetic nervous system. So you increase parasympathetic tone and you help kids control their bodies. It develops some um, very basic ideas of cognitive restructuring. You know, in adults, we talk about automatic thoughts. In kids, we like try to make it a comic strip, like the thought bubble that's in your head that you can't, um, that you feel but but uh, nobody can can see so that they kind of can can look at it at their level um and you and you talk about ways that you can kind of help um kids ex exposed to things and, and some sometimes exposure is very different than adults um i use i use an example still from my colleague dr ladrowski you know if you have a, a kid who's anxious about um, go into the bathroom. You can't really like kids, little kids especially. You can't like walk them through mindfulness exercises of practicing going to the bathroom. You actually kind of have to walk them to the bathroom themselves and expose them directly because they're not able to to do that sort of um, delayed thoughts about the future. So you have to kind of make it much more hands on. And then how do you kind of contain that? And so the family piece is really important too. And we add that um, because, you know, I, I think I think parenting in general is an anxious exercise um, as, as you care and worry about your own kids. And one of the things that sometimes kids with anxiety feed on is their parental reactions and, and helping a child move, um, move toward um, being able to, to kind of do those things on their own, they have to, you know, the parents sort of the teacher and how they model how you might handle anxiety. So it may involve a lot of work in that regard or helping validate the feeling, but not giving in to the feeling that you have to really work with with kids and parents on. And, and some things um, are very important because, you know, if you're if you see your child as distressed, um, one of the things we, we want to do is rescue them and make them feel better. And with anxiety disorders, that's really tricky because the easiest way sometimes to help our kid feel better is to avoid what's stressing them. And we may inadvertently as parents encourage avoidant behavior that really is the problem. And as I said, if your child is stressed out about going to school, pulling them out of school and not making them go makes them feel better until it doesn't anymore. Um, but that avoidance may have, have made the problem worse. And how do you encourage the, the engagement while still being understanding of the stress? really involves a, a really huge collaboration with the parent and understanding and educating about about that interaction. So um, I, I'll just show you some cool things. I'll give Amanda, if you're still on, I'll give you a chance to kind of share maybe some extra things you have about therapy. But 
you got to really think about the kid that you have in front of you with therapy and figure out how they, they might talk. Little kids might need puppets because they can't tell you with their own words, but it's always easier to, to have the puppets talk. They may be playing in the metaphor and working out their anxieties in a dollhouse. Um, or they may be a kid that just has to not look at you and play with the sand so that they can get the words out and distracting their bodies and having something to do with their hands makes it easy to talk. So it may take a little while to, to meet them. Coloring books are out there where they're coloring pictures about emotions. There can be all kinds of ways. Anything that increases the word finding ability of little kids will often decrease distress because they have a way to communicate it. Um, Here's kind of some examples of breathing. I mean, we all talk about breathing um, and you can certainly talk to a, a person, an adult about breathing. With kids, you almost have to show them and you might actually like lay them down on the floor and put the ball on their chest and move the ball up and down so they can see um, how, how much they need to breathe and, and they may have to practice with you. Um, because again, it's the doing part that their brain encodes, not sometimes the telling. And so it's a, a very hands-on exercise sometimes to teach, especially younger kids this. Um, same thing with muscle relaxation. You actually have to sometimes walk them through it. There's lots of cool ways to do this. You can do it in a progression like this, but there's other trickier ways you can help kids. I don't know if any of you remember some games that used to be played I call it ragdoll robot, but they might like play music and you would walk real stiff like a robot. And then when the music stopped, you like relaxed like a ragdoll. You really were teaching kids in a fun way how to help control their body movements and, and kind of making it a game while teaching them a, a very important self-control skill. Um, we can even sort of get the cognitive thoughts in. As I said, you want to kind of get this idea of how cognition affects behavior. And for kids, that's a real big leap. And so we sometimes use tricks like comic books or things like that to kind of get the idea that you can have a thought and a behavior be separate. And sometimes we draw pictures, sometimes we use thought bubbles um, to talk about how that automatic thought might be how you reacted to this. So what was SpongeBob thinking um, before you saw that, that thing unfold? So the kid sort of thinks about how that something was going on in, in the head before he acted, but really breaking that down so they can start making these linkages. Um, this is sort of an example of the thought reframing. What if you just, what if he changed that thought bubble? What other things could he have thought instead? And kind of doing some problem solving in this, this strategy of cognitive reframing. Again, very hands-on is, is, can be part of that exercise. Um, sometimes we just help kids give give a, an intensity to it, you know, and, and this you can use things like a thermometer, a barometer, a rating scale, you know, trying to anything that sort of expands their emotional vocabulary or lets them tell you how they feel can be tricks that we use. Here's the feeling thermometer of intensity. Um, and I'm going to pause before I go into medicine because I, I, I think little kid therapy is probably one of the most fun things in the world and you can always get more creative, but um, it's really important that, that you, it's, it's an interactive process um, and it can, be, it can be really fun. And then when the kid gets it, they get it and it's, it's really cool to see how they might teach that to others. But I, I will say, and Amanda can, can add to this, but some kids take a lot longer than others to learn these skills. It's very much um, like you're playing teacher and, and some kids have very different trajectories than others and how they, they learn skills. And so if you have a kid that doesn't talk very well, the whole beginning of therapy might be just finding words before you start getting to more advanced techniques. Amanda, do you have any other deep, deep therapy ideas to, to add to work in, especially with maybe little kids with therapy? With I don't know about deep, deep therapy <laughs> ideas, but I think that I think that you really hit the nail on the head when you talked about, you know, really taking into consideration when you're working with younger children um, in early childhood, pulling in the parents. That's probably the key piece to some. CBT and working with anxious children. A lot of the time, some of the work is done with just the child. And sometimes children can memorize, but it's really important to incorporate the parent because the parent needs to help that child identify that thought process and where they're at with that. And because they can't stop those thoughts to help control their emotions, they need help with that part. And so for one, helping them identify 
you know, what anxiety is. A lot of the times we have like, like um, Lauren was talking about, we have comics, we have books that can help identify what anxiety is. And little kids love reading books. And a lot of the times I'll have their parents read it so that they understand that their parents are comfortable with this. Um, because sometimes we have, well, a lot of the times we have parents with high anxiety that come in naturally with young kids with high anxiety. And so parents have you know, have this release and trying to start to identify that. And so that's really nice. Um, you know, working with thought distortions, we always go to, you know, I, I always go to identifying the good worry and bad worry. And like Lauren's saying, sometimes it's with the giant bubbles, you know, sometimes it's with, you know, good and bad faces. And so this can really help kids identify like you know, how legitimate their worries are. Some kids will come in and identify. I had a six-year-old that talked about not wanting to get food on their shirt because one time when mommy was in a really bad mood, she really yelled at me for getting food on my shirt, right? And the mom was like, oh my goodness, you don't have to worry about that. Like, and so mom didn't even know that that was a worry. That was really kind of a bad worry because it's not, it's not something you should worry about. And so helping them identify what's a good worry, bad worry. Um, we use like a detective for them to kind of detect what they sense, right? So, you know, anxiety will show up as some physical symptoms first. And so we talk about ways to be a detective to find out those physical symptoms, right? Because if you ask a kid like, so what, like, how were you feeling right before that? I don't know. <laughs> They're not gonna know. And this is exactly where you need that parent to come in and help with that as well. So when a parent can identify some of the, um, you know, parents quickly identify the nail biting um, or biting on their, on their, uh, shirts. And so some of the anxious behaviors, then they can stop and kind of say, okay, what are some of your thoughts? Let's be a detective. Let's put on your detective hat. And I had one kid that would um, get the magnifying glass every time he was trying to figure out what was going on with his body at that time, right? Um, other, other things that we went to using were um, weighing the worry. So how heavy is the worry? How big is the worry to the kids? So we identify good and bad worries but also how heavy is this worry to them? Like, what, what do you weight it as? And we use like visuals. So is it, is it like a muscle building weight or is it a feather, right? Is it as light as a feather? Um, with the good worry, bad worry, we use balloons too. So that helps teach them the deep breathing. So breathing in and then blowing out but blowing out some of the bad worries in the balloons. And then we would tie them up and pop the bad worries to get rid of them. And the good worries we keep, right? And we play with the good worries. And so um, we use those metaphors for, for some therapy. I'm trying to think, one of the big ones that I use too in helping kids start to identify and parents start to identify that physical symptom um, with their worries is body outlines. So having kids lay down and you know outline their bodies on giant paper. I have posts like like the um, you know the teaching paper, and I put two together, and the kids lay on it, and we outline it, and then um, they color inside their bodies where they're feeling that worry, and we talk about it. They put a certain color to it, so they talk about how it feels, and so this helps them start it to relate to what that physical symptom is so that it helps the parents identify a little bit better to move forward with that. And so this really helps to build that along as, you know, again, you have to identify cognitively where they're at, but this helps to build that so that when they're at that cognitive capacity, you can start to help them identify those thought distortions on their own. But it's great to help practice this ahead of time so that they're well aware. So they get, they identify those physical symptoms, those thought distortions, and some of the emotions that come from that. But yeah. And, and I would add too, as, as kids get a little bit older, sometimes I, I have found that um, their parents may have struggled or had the same kind of anxiety they did but but sometimes the parents start using the techniques to help themselves and the kids kind of call the parent out on the symptoms and so you kind of end up sometimes doing cbt work and and this kind of work with the whole family and it's kind of it's kind of cool um sometimes we we certainly have 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 seen that as as people buy in so and 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 talking about the next step of this is medicine um and and generally speaking with most kids we really do consider therapy first line unless unless there are reasons to consider medicine and, and part of that's um 
there's several several reasons for that. One, our kids really little bodies don't handle all these medicines as well as adolescents because the the tracks uh, for serotonin and norepinephrine just really aren't well developed and, and aren't completely developed till about mid twenties. So prepubescent kids always have a little higher rate of side effects and and their their response to these medicines may not be as predictable. So so medicines don't always work as well. And so we, we don't usually reach for those first line um, in anxious kids. The second reason is the power of avoidance. We really wanna address the anxiety and help people understand it. So we don't build in a lifelong avoidant pattern in kids. And it, it's almost impossible to fight anxiety if avoidance is there without therapy because they have developed a way of avoiding stress so much that it's very hard. The medicine may make you feel better, but you'll never know it if it works or helped you if you don't learn how to address and work through anxiety. So often anxiety um, treatment really needs to go side and side with therapy if you're thinking about medicine. Now there may be some, some very good reasons to, to think about medication um, for kids or, or medication first and then therapy. Um, but as a general rule, if, if the child is able to participate in therapy, it's always a really good start um, because you may help them without the need for medicine. Now, a couple of caveats to that um, are that sometimes kids are so anxious they can't do therapy. Um, sometimes they're too afraid to go to the therapist or some things like if they're having recurrent panic attacks or they have such severe like OCD behaviors that they can't break cycles to, to get into um, the work of therapy because they're so distressed. Some of those kids may do better with, with a little bit of medicine to bring down the symptoms so they can do a better job in therapy. Um, the other reason would be if you've tried therapy and still are really struggling with any functional gains after about 12 weeks, medicine would also be reasonable. And, and and often a lot of the folks here, I get referrals for the medicine for anxiety when, when that's been the case. Therapy has not gotten worked as effectively for that kid and, and we're trying to add to their treatment plan. So as a general rule, most of what we're gonna be talking about are, are these medicines. Um, and these are medicines that at least in some capacity increase serotonin and serotonin really is one of the key neurotransmitters here interesting there is not a single ssri that is approved for pediatric anxiety and if, if any of you remember back to my my basic psychopharm talk this is the situation where evidence base and the fda indications do not always match so although there is not an fda indication for ssris there's definitely evidence for SSRIs in pediatric patients, and, and here are some of the, the literature. Probably the strongest medications we have evidence for are um, fluoxetine, which is Prozac, and sertraline. Now, some of these also have some evidence in OCD, um, but we certainly have data on all these medicines that show some benefits. Interestingly, the one that is FDA approved is duloxetine, or Cymbalta for GAD, and that was a recent indication in 2014, and it is approved for seven to 17 for generalized anxiety. Again, it was a, it was a medicine with a pharmaceutical indication to go after that because it was brand name. That was based on two good studies, but there are probably more studies of the SSRIs, um, but, but they were generic, so no one went after the, the FDA indication. So typically, um, a, a sort of approach would, would be to consider first line Symbolta or an SSRI. Um, and if that failed, either consider a second line agent or go to a third. We really do not use tricyclic antidepressants much at all anymore. They have very high suicide, I'm sorry, very high death rates from ingestion and can be a risk factor for suicide because of their lethality. And um, it really does not work very well for depression um, other than clomipramine, which has a higher serotonin level, um, just does not demonstrate the efficacy either. So we tend to avoid um, tricyclics. That being said, there are maybe some reasons why you would pick a tricyclic. Sometimes tricyclics can be 
interestingly used for migraine headaches like Elevil or some sleep when nothing else works and, and tricyclics also help with bedwetting. Um, so if you have kids sometimes with other comorbidities, it may make sense to consider a low dose tricyclic, but as a single agent, we're, we're usually relying on um, one of the, the SSRIs um, or, or some um, Symbolta. Effexor also has some um, data, that's the vinlafaxine. Um, has some data. So much, much like um, depression, we usually consider one or two SSRI trials first, and then an SNRI as, as, a, as a second line agent. Um, you do not see um, escitalopram or Celexa on this list because there's not as many much data for anxiety. But we do know that escitalopram or, or Lexapro is, is approved for pediatric um, depression. And so there is some evidence that it probably does help anxiety, especially panic and OCD as well. But again, just not as many studies as some of the earlier ones. Um, and, and here's the hardest part of, of this is um, if you have anxious children and anxious parents, talking about the side effects of these medicines can be terrifying. <laughs> Um, and some kids who are already somatic um, with their anxiety are, are afraid to take something. And I sometimes have the conversation with the kid, I don't want to make you upset um, or worry about things. Would you like me to talk with your parent about this by yourself so you don't have to, to get worried about what I say? And you can just let me know if there's something about your body that feels scary or different. And most of the time, anxious kids don't want to hear anything I have to say when we talk about this, because um, if I tell you it could upset your stomach, it probably will. Um, and so you have to, to be very cautious. And what I will tell you is in the long run, it almost always gets better if it's related to anxiety those early steps can be really hard and, and parents can call you for every little thing. And so I usually say, you know, if it's still there after a week, after we make a change, you let me know. But usually it does, it, it, if it's subtle, it gets better in that, in that week. Um, but this is a very hard thing. Is it a side effect or is it the anxiety? And I spend a lot of time talking about this um, when, I, when, we, when we make choices. Um, so generally speaking, SSRIs are, are pretty well tolerated. The biggest side effect, of course, is GI distress and, and headaches and restlessness, which are also all great somatic symptoms of anxiety. Um, so that's, that's the hard part. There are things that are quite notable. Um, SSRIs, that serotonin load in a little child, if you give them too much serotonin, if their body cannot handle that serotonin you will see them look hyperactive. You may make a child look ADHD that does not have ADHD before. That's one of the most common things. And that's an activation or disinhibition response that comes from the serotonin. And it can look really kind of uncomfortable and just make them look moody and intense. Um, that, that, that is a side effect. But you have to go very slow sometimes with very low doses and build them up. Um, you want to not give these if you think there was truly evidence of bipolar in the kid. Um, and I always ask, has anyone else in your family tried a medicine like this? And I would try to go with something that was tolerated in a first degree relative or in other family members if I could. Sometimes the answer is if everyone in the family did well with Lexapro, I will pick Lexapro, um, even if the evidence is a little bit better. Because one, they have some comfort with that, they know what to expect, but also there's some genetic indication they might just do better. Um, if, if they have success with an SSRI, we usually ask people to stay on it for at least a year, if not 18 months. Some of that is just so you can recover and practice the skills of working through that avoidance without the autonomic response of anxiety, so they get used to the practicing. But anxiety disorders have a pretty high risk of relapse, especially in kids. And so sometimes they, they need to, to go back on them because the dysfunction comes back if they haven't really processed a lot of those coping skills. Um, I go very slowly, and, and, but I go steadily um, because although you have to start low and go slow, sometimes kids need just as high of dose of these medicines as adults do to really get the anti-anxiety effect. And, 
as I said, sometimes I look just smart because I just increase people's doses of things they'd already started on because they weren't in the, the right range. And so usually if I'm not getting anywhere, I do dose increases. I, I'd sort of pick my target dose and then I always bump it up about three or four weeks later if we're not moving toward the target. Um, the, the, the important thing to remember is these medicines with anxiety are not 100% fixes. We're going for functional improvement. And so if you get someone 50% better, that's really considered success. And maybe as far as you get with medicines, they, they don't have, they, we're not trying, we can't take away anxiety. It was meant to rescue us from true danger. Um, and so we, we cannot get rid of natural anxiety responses completely. We have to get it down to a tolerable level. And if we're still struggling, we really need to make sure that we're thinking about accessing services at school, accessing additional supports, making sure they're in therapy to get them the rest of the way. So here's just some of my, my, dosing, my dosing rules. Um, so I kind of split it based on puberty, um, if, they're, if they've kind of hit puberty or not. So for fluoxetine, I start at five for my, my prepubescent kids and 10 for my, my kids like over puberty. For anxiety, you're probably getting to an initial range of, of 10 to 40 milligrams. And, and sometimes kids don't get a ton of anxiolytic response until they get to 30. And, and you see over here, these dose ranges that are, are high are still what are there in adults. You just have to go slower and start lower with getting there. Um, so Alexa, citalopram, five and 10. Escitalopram, I start two or two and a half or five. And sertraline, I start 25 or 50. If there are side effects, I slow it down and even half it down to that. Um, but I will usually, usually kind of work the dose up to, to these sort of target ranges slowly over maybe the first two months and then hold a little bit to see. But if you have no side effects and you're still on the low range of this side, don't be afraid to keep going. I can't tell you, I get tons of people that have been on really low dose SSRIs for years. The low doses are not gonna get you the, the, the anti-anxiety effect of these medicines. Um, same thing with the uh, Cymbalta and the, the Venlafaxine in your SNRIs. Um, there's a couple other anxiolytics out there in the adult world. Again, less, less data for kids. Um, Buspirone or Buspar is an add-on. Um, there's not a ton of data about Buspar. There's actually some negative studies that it didn't really do a whole lot better than placebo. Again, probably because of how kids handle serotonin. But it's really well tolerated and didn't have a lot of side effects. And I have had some kids do quite well with that, so that may be an option, especially if they had some SSRI intolerability. But again, not great data. Um, we sometimes use things like gabapentin or Lyrica going after the GABAergic system in adults. There's certainly adult data on those for social anxiety, but not a lot of, of, of data in children and adolescents. Benzodiazepines we tend to to avoid in kids for a lot of different reasons. One, Benzos really do inhibit learning and memory consolidation, so long-term benzo use is really not helpful. And apart from like rescue medication from panic disorder, scheduling benzodiazepines for anxiety is, is generally not even best practice in adults. So we want to really reserve those for um, small populations. And of course, there's always the risk of, of substance use and withdrawal, um, but kids can get pretty sleepy with these things. I tend to reserve these for severe panic we're trying to kind of get through an acute stressor to practice the engagement strategies to get through avoidance in somebody that has such a surge, but do it very, very mildly. If you've never seen a kid have a paradoxical response for a benzo, you have to be aware of this. I have a five-year-old in the PICU today that keeps having these um, and had a horrific paradoxical response to Ativan, and he was really agitated and aggressive for, for about three or four hours, and it's really scary. Um, and and it looks like they are completely out of control. It's unusual, but if you're younger or older, it can happen and look really scary. I, I personally have a pet peeve about hydroxyzine. This kind of goes to Richard's story actually about um, the, the older patients. Um, in psychiatry, we, we prescribe a lot of hydroxyzine um, and it's a lot easier to, to feel better about than a benzo um, because you didn't have to write it. But um, this is fancy Benadryl and it really does not have any evidence for anxiety. It makes you sleepy. 
it aids in avoidance. And sometimes it's the right answer. Like if you really just need to fall asleep and this works, okay. If you need this to fall asleep because you're having a panic attack, okay. But if you take it every single day, it loses its sedation effect. And you're really just exposing people to high doses of anticholinergic medication. And that has significant impacts on learning and cognition and has been a risk factor for developing dementia. And so um, just be mindful that this isn't becoming an escape um, a use of medicine as, as cognitive escape because I'm living in foggy anticholinergic haze and, and really has utility. Again, I think there is nothing wrong with short-term use, but if you're getting to daily use, it's probably not best practice and may have some additional risks. Um, beta blockers like um, propranolol can be helpful for some kids, especially with panic symptoms. Um, it can be really helpful with performance anxiety. Again, helping kind of a kid distance the physical feeling from the cognitive symptoms. If you block the heart rate racing, they might be able to perform and work through the anxiety without the intensity of that. Again, very low dose, usually five to 10 milligrams. They take about 30 minutes for it from the performance. And you do a practice dose when they don't need it to make sure they don't have any cardiovascular effects. The limiting factor in kids is that you can't use these medicines in asthma because they do constrict the um, vessels. And a lot of kids have asthma. Um, and so I frequently am asking pediatricians if the kid's asthma is stable, if, if it's something that I could try or not. Um, and again, this is usually as needed. Um, although I do have some kids, I have scheduled it for a little while, especially those that have hyper or a lot of hyper arousal symptoms. I might schedule it for a week or two um, and then taper it off. Um, so again, here are those FDA um, indications just to review. Um, fluoxetine is for depression. Um, escitalopram is depression 12 and up. Um, Prozac, sertraline, Luvox, and clomipramine are all for pediatric OCD. They have that, that label. Um, but as a general rule, most SSRIs um, can be used for anxiety disorders, including panic, irritability, and GAD. They're off-label, but there's good evidence. The one thing I would, would say, and it's right at the bottom, is do not use Paxil in children or paroxetine in children unless you avoid it. That, that being said, I did have one family that said everybody in my family responded to Paxil, so I, I did Paxil with the kid. But, but pediatric um, patients who metabolize things faster metabolize Paxil very quickly. So kids often end up in withdrawal symptoms late in the day that can be very uncomfortable and look like mood or behavioral disturbances. And it's probably this withdrawal effect that makes it more susceptible to side effects. And some people even thought um, maybe part of the restless akathisia risk that was associated with increased suicide risk. So when we talk about black box warnings for these medications, it's really related mostly to Paxil. And they went back and separated out the data and it's the one that has all the scary warnings that was pulled out also as a category D rating in pregnancy. And then we sometimes think about other SNRIs um, like the, the duloxetine and the venlafaxine if there's, if there's maybe complicated neuropathic pain um, or functional abdominal pain and then duloxetine has the generalized anxiety um, data as well. Um, again, just some, some quick things before we run out of time. I'm sorry I'm going over, but I'm going to try to finish really quickly for those of you who are able to stay. Um, all of these do have side effects um, and can, if you go too fast or escalate the dose too quickly, you can get akathisia, which can feel like work, worsening anxiety. So that's part of the go low, start low, go slow, is to really minimize that, that restless feeling. If you stop them suddenly, um, the exception usually being Prozac, people don't feel good. They get a flu-like sort of effect. Prozac has a very long half-life and self-tapers itself. So this sometimes becomes a better choice for people that might not be as consistent with medicine. If you've been on an SSRI long-term, you can develop an A-motivation syndrome too, and people feel like they don't care about anything, but don't have any other side effects of depression. And that's actually a side effect of long-term receptor upregulation. And sometimes it just needs changed or cross-tapered to something else to get back to efficacy. If you're worried about mania, you know, that, that we don't know about. These medicines can certainly trigger mania. I, I will tell you there's a difference between activation and flipping someone into mania. Activation is that acute agitation that occurs when you first start the medicine from too much serotonin load. 
flipping occurs after a period of stability on the SSRI where the mania emerges later. So it's usually a later effect. And then all of these, because they have the same warnings for the kids with depression, all have the black box warning on suicidality, which is here. And I, in just the interest of time, I want you to know there's some fabulous resources you can give to parents. Um, the one for depression includes a very long discussion about the risks and benefits of the SSRIs from this website, and also really helps put perspective that, that suicide risk, I think, in a way that's good for parents to understand. Um, and then here was a, a study that looked at, well, they, should I give you therapy, medicines, or both? Um, this is the CAM study, and this is often cited. They had a CBT group, um, a medication-only group, a combination group, and then a placebo. And you see here that the improvement um, was best in the combination group of the Zoloft mixed with CBT was an 80% improvement. Now, one of the things I want to point out to you, which is very different in other parts of psychiatry, is if you can only pick one, CBT or sertraline, you'll actually see the therapy has, has better rates than success of the medicine by itself. Um, so if you're only able to pick one, pick the therapy piece. Um, again, I think it really is important with anxiety that we target healthy developmental coping skills to work through this because it's a developmental task. Um, I'm going to stop there, give you my PALS line, and answer questions. Awesome. Thank you, Dr. Swagger. Um, let's see, we got a lot of great comments in the chat um, earlier on in the didactic as well, so definitely take a look at that. Were there any questions for Dr. Swagger? Or comments? That was excellent. Thank you. Um, I'm so happy we were able to uh, schedule a part two for you to present. So say something if I could. Um, I, I, thank you. It's do Dr. here. Um, so um, I appreciate you bringing up the anxiolytic uh, portion and I just wanted to comment on uh, specifically the visceral use. So uh, I actually in the last four months had two pediatric patients that came in who were having um, a situational uh, anxiety um, specifically panic attacks. Um, and, and I used low-dose visceral in both of those patients with really great success. Um, one of them uh, had, was, has um, epilepsy and was having refractory seizures, and we were getting her from one facility to another, and somebody had actually put her on clonopin, like daily clonopin, and it made her suicidal. Um, and so I saw her in the ER and we pulled her off of that and I had her mother just give her, you know, we increased some of her uh, baseline seizure medication and I gave her Visteril for kind of like her breakthrough panic attacks and it, re you know, she resolved within 24 hours, actually had no memory of being suicidal on benzodiazepine. Um, so that's just one little thing. And then another one was a seven year old who was going through court systems with visitation with her mother um, who had drug issues and really didn't want to see her mother. And so just, you know, every couple of days just had these episodes where she couldn't breathe. And so I think she probably ended up taking um, Visteral like three times over a week period while she came up to this court session with her mom and, and just got great feedback from her caregiver about how helpful that was for her. Um, I certainly would never give, I mean, I hate giving it to adults um, daily uh, and, and I don't, um, but I just wanted to, to put that little feedback in there that I realized there's not a lot of good data behind it. But, you know, when you're, you're out in the country and, and, you know, people are coming to you like, what do we do? What you said was like the perfect choices, though, for that, right? Acute time limited things that like, I mean, that was not, that was often situational. Those are really, I mean, those are great examples. I, I, as I said, that's, that's kind of the perfect way to choose that. Um, I, I think I, I end up seeing people that have been taking it four times a day for six months and are still having panic. So remember, it does not prevent panic. So once it kind of crosses out of that situational thing, that, that's the point. But you know, three, four weeks, no problem at all. I think if you start seeing people using it a lot more regularly, definitely time to switch. But I think those are excellent, perfect examples of really good choices for the Vistro. Thank you for the feedback. Any other uh, questions? I just wanted to say first, uh, Richard, that was a really good um, presentation. And uh, in our program, when a patient is enrolled in the disease management coordinator 
which are nurses. We have a whole team. We have social workers for not only social needs, like community resources, but for psych. If, if somebody needs to talk, we have a couple of them that do have uh, dual degrees. And we have pharmacists. And the enrollment process is always any new person coming in gets um, a review by the pharmacist with the patient. They do like an hour review on with the patient. And that, that's one of the things they do look for is any medicines that aren't necessary because their finding poly medicine is very much a cause of some of the issues. And a lot of my patients are discharged from the hospital and it's always interesting how the discharge changes a lot of their home medicine. So we have found a lot of discrepancy. Um, things were stopped because they weren't in the formulary in the hospital, but when they got home, the patient didn't know, should I take them? And of course, one of the things in the time I've worked on this team is that we did the ABS differently. I actually got to be um, really uh, helpful in that. I was really excited to be part of that because I did a ma I got my master's in nursing and my thesis was discharge planning. And so they asked me to be part of that team. And it was amazing to me, like some of my patients the medicine, but it was on page 13 of the ABS. <laughs> so, you know, when we streamlined that ABS, that made um, patient understanding of what their discharge instructions were much better. Um, but having the pharmacist anytime, if there's any kind of problems, I have that resource and they're wonderful and they do look at that um, discharge medicines as well as ongoing medicines. And of course, we're working very closely with the PCP. So, so, you know, um, they actually will reach out and talk to the PCP on the behalf of the patient if they see something that maybe needs to be addressed. So that's really nice. And then I just wanted to say, Lauren, you and I have talked before about coping mechanisms when I worked in Head Start. I found that anytime we could, uh, we had great early intervention teams that were a team. Uh, the parent and the child, of course, very much a center core of that team. And I found that many parents, were young and didn't have the skills to cope either. So having them be part of that learning for the child helped them to learn. And then they were all, like you said, a family. It really was a family session and helping all of them learn to cope with a, a situation. Thank you for sharing that, Donna. That's that's all excellent. Um, and I will be sure to include the link that Richard uh, added into the chat, into the recap email as well for everyone, um, along with Dr. Swagger's PowerPoint for those of you who didn't get to see the first half back in uh, July. So. Um, we are at the end of our session time, unfortunately. You guys all know I always wish these sessions were a little longer. Um, but just a few last housekeeping an announcements. Our next session will be on September 2nd, and Colleen Lillard will be providing our didactic. So keep an eye out for that uh, reminder email. Uh, I just want to give a shout out to Richard. That was an excellent case presentation. Thank you again for joining today. Um, and thank you, Dr. Swagger, for your didactic as well. Um, so we will see you all next time. Thank you. Thank you so much.